I mean, it was just wonderful for somebody like me, so mathematical, and I loved numbers, and I was this slide rule whiz in my high school, and um, usually in electronics, it's like a vocational course, and the top academic students don't take it. But a few of us top academic students would take electronics, and we were the ones, you know, kind of more superior like engineers. Um, the teacher, in my case, I had so much electronics experience from ham radio and a whole bunch of digital science fair projects, including adders, subtractors, and all that, that the, my teacher said, you already know all the electronics here, and you're just going to play pranks and wire other people's radios up so they explode. So I've arranged for you to go down to a company once a week outside of the school. He went beyond the school boundaries. You know, I never saw any other teachers that did that. Most teachers say, here's what we have to teach. Here are our books, and here's what the learning is and you go find the extra on your own. But this teacher every year helped a few students get into business, kind of on a co-op basis. So I got to go down to Sylvania once a week and program a thing called a computer. We didn't have computers in high school then. So this was, wow, I was like the most important person in the world. My dream in life computers, I got to program one. What can a computer do? A million things a second. A computer can count a million times a second. How fast can a human being count? figure it out and it takes you, you know, two weeks if you don't go to sleep and you might count to a million, but I doubt it. So this computer can do it in one second. How powerful. One of my first programs I wrote was the Knight's Tour, where a knight piece on a chessboard tries to hit every square exactly once and not twice. And then you get stuck and bouncing around randomly and you back up and you try a different approach and back up and try a different approach and you'll get the solution. And I wrote the program and it would do a million things a second and get the answer and nothing came out. And the next week I printed chess boards and I finally saw that my program was good, but it was gonna take 10 to the 25th years to solve. Which is a very good early example of raw speed, raw power in a computer isn't how you solve a lot of problems that are simple and especially problems that are complex. You need good approaches that come from the mind. You need good methods, good algorithms. While I was down, I discovered that year, I, in my senior year of high school, I discovered mini computers, what they were about. Mini computers were big boxes with lights that had A0, A1, A2, A3, all these geeky sounding nomenclature. And it's a front panel, and it's like the old computers that you see glorified in movies, and you're afraid. If you walked up and you were a normal person, and maybe half the people in this audience are normal people, and half might be engineers or, or vice versa. So we might have some business people here, I'm told. So, um, so then you'd walk up and you would say, I would not ever dare touch that machine because I wouldn't know one thing about one button that I'm pressing that somehow says, you know, arrow to memory or something. And um, so that's what these machines were. They were very sterile. They looked like they belonged on a factory floor. But I accidentally discovered a manual that described the architecture of one. Imagine that you have a lot of experience with lumber, and I had a lot of experience with logic at the time, and you have a design of, of a building with certain windows and doors and rooms, well, you could theoretically start to put down the pieces of lumber you're familiar with and construct a drawing of that building. Similarly, I took chip manuals of the day, and chips were pretty weak back then, you know, one gate on a chip, and I would design on paper my version of this computer that I now had a description of its architecture, the PDP-8. And it took me quite a few weeks, quite a few tries, and on weekends I would shut the door in my room. I was a very shy person then, wouldn't involve anyone else, I'd sit on my white table, and I'd just start trying to teach myself, how would you design a computer? No books, no reference materials, they didn't sell books on how to make, how computers were made in stores back then. And I eventually designed this computer. And then I thought, wow, what about other mini computers? So a friend and I, I thought, I'm so interested in computers, but there's no books in the technical library. Where would you find a good technical library? Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. I hate to use the word. Um, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center had some of the brightest minds. They would surely have manuals on computers there. So a friend and I drove in on a Sunday so we wouldn't get caught. So, so we, every single Sunday we went there, we'd climb stairs and find a door unlocked somewhere. We'd get into the building, go to the library, and I would read magazines for engineers on computers. And I could fill out little cards and order manuals for the very end mini computers of the day. 
for the Hewlett Packard mini computers of the day, for the digital equipment mini computers of the day. And every time I got a manual that described the architecture of a computer, close my door at home on a weekend and start designing my version of it. And after a while I made a game. How can I do this better and better and better? Kind of like seeking perfection. How can I be better than I ever was? Strange ideas in my head, ways to use parts of gates that were supposed to be something called a register, but use it as something else called an inverter just because it will work, even though it's not designed that way. Everything I could to save parts. And I thought engineering is all about efficiency. So many times we're looking for output divided by input, getting the most out for the least in. And to me that was, you. if something is very short and simple, be it a program, be it hardware, fewer parts was more valuable. And it just became a little game. And I got very, very good at this. I uh, looked at my designs and they were like half as many chips as the companies that were shipping the computers. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when you create energy these days, energy is one of the big engineering problems of the near future. It's like, we've got to look at how can we get a little more efficiency, a little more energy out of some molecules, out of the sunlight, whatever, to you know make some of the, the new advances, the green advances go. A company came out with a mini computer called, this company started up called Data General. They had the Nova mini computer. And it was one of those rectangular boxes with a front panel, switches for ones and zeros, and buttons to push them into memory. And um, it had a very different architecture than all the others. I sat down one weekend, closed my door, and started designing my chips into this computer, the Data General Nova. And it took half as many chips as all the other mini computers. And I was stunned. And I came to a realization, if you design an architecture exactly matching the parts that are available, you can use very few parts and have just as good a computer. And that stuck with me for the rest of my life. That was gonna be my philosophy of what good design was, very few parts. I told my father, Someday, I'm gonna own a 4K Nova computer so I can write programs. And he said, that'll cost as much as a house. And I said, I'll live in an apartment. That was gonna, I would rather have a computer in my life than a house. I was lucky to get either, is it? <laughs> but, um, no, computers, well, Moore's Law took care of that. Alrighty, my first year of college, Computer courses in most colleges, all but a very, very few, were graduate courses only. Introduction to computers was a graduate course. And I was enrolled in engineering, so I was allowed to take it. And wow, I got to write Fortran programs. It was a great course. I learned a lot. I got an A plus, and I got to write Fortran programs. So I started writing programs that calculated tables of numbers. I had seven programs that calculated things like powers of two, Fibonacci numbers. They would print 60 pages of output and stop before I got kicked off the computer, and then punch out the card so I could substitute some punch cards in, run it again, and get the next 60 pages in order. And the next 60 pages, and the numbers were growing until they were longer than a whole page, and I was piling up reams of output in my dorm room, seven programs a day, three runs a day on the supercomputer at our campus, um, times 60 pages each, and they stopped my programs from running. And I got put on probation for what I call computer abuse. But it turns out I didn't realize, I thought when you signed up for a computer class, you got to use the computer. Unfortunately, I didn't realize that there was a little, there was a little structure in the background called budgets. And I ran our class five times over budget <laughs> for computer use, and it was more than out-of-state tuition. So um, that was a good year because electronics, people that don't know electronics, you can have an awful lot of fun with them. Or imagine if they don't know computers, the little tricks you can put onto their screen that might come up and what is going on here, the fun you can have. Well, I went down to Radio Shack and bought a high-speed transistor. I wound a coil and put a little capacitor on, designed up a little tiny, tiny transmitter that would jam TV signals. And the black and white TVs in our dorm, it would jam just real good, I tested it. And so I went over to this hall, Libby Hall, and down in the basement they had a color TV. And uh, sit in the back and I finally jammed it a little and it fuzzed up the picture. So I made it go good. And then after a while I would jam it and he would whack it and it would go good. And it was amazing to watch this effect because I hadn't planned it, but it was like a psychology experiment. And for two weeks, they put one person next to the TV set every night. Whenever the picture went bad, he had to turn the controls or whack it till it went good. And sometimes one time they held the antenna up in the air to make it good. And eventually they had to stand on a chair. 
another time, one guy had his hand on the middle of the screen. Three guys were fixing the TV. One guy had his hand on the middle of the screen and a foot up in the air on a chair. And I made it go good. And eventually they relaxed and it went bad. And they said, put your bodies back where they were. Because by now they were sure that where their bodies were made the TV work. Eventually he put his hand on the TV and it worked. And he put his foot down on the floor and it failed. And he put his foot back up on the chair and it worked. And he turned to the audience and announced, it's a grounding effect. I think he was an electrical engineer. Um, because they were going to charge, they acted like they were going to charge me so much to go back. They scared me away from that school. And, and the next year I went to um, college in Cupertino. And a friend of mine worked in the computer room with the IBM 360 Model 40. And he had copied the key to the room. So we would go in at midnight. To me, have you ever watched Happy Gilmore, any of you? The ball wants to go in the hole. The hole is your home. Well, a computer sitting there at night, unused, wants to compute, doesn't it? So we'd go in at midnight and put paper in front of the terminals that shows the jobs. And I'd run programs late into the night, two, three, four in the morning. And we'd close things up and go back home. So that was a great year. I just wanted to write every program I could, take every course I could, even ones that wouldn't carry credit to Berkeley. Um, next year, I didn't have money for Berkeley, so I took a year off to work and earn the money for my third year of college. Walked into a door by accident, and they were building a medium-sized computer. This computer was going to run the DMV, two of them, for the next 20 years. It was that good a computer. And I got a job there programming. And while I was there, I mentioned to one of the engineers how I used to design computers back in high school. I would design all the mini computers. And he said, did you ever build one? I said, no, I could never get the parts. I could never afford them. And he said, well, he had connections with chip companies, and he would get me some parts if I designed a computer. So I went home and designed a very minimal computer and came back the next day, and he gave me the parts. And um, I went home and took took about a week or two to wire it up down the street. This friend of mine, we were wiring it in his garage. He said, you've got to meet this guy, Steve Jobs. He goes to the same high school as us, and he's into the things you're into. He likes, he knows digital electronics and things that have counters and numbers on them, and he likes to play pranks at school. So Steve came over, and we're sitting there on the sidewalk sizing each other up. You know, he played a couple of nice pranks, you know, with phones on some lines that were in tunnels under the school that I didn't know about. And I had tons and tons of my own pranks. And then we talked about our electronics and I talked about my computer designs and all that. And so we, were, we became best friends for the next eight years. Um, he had a nice home and family, his mother, father, sister. I didn't realize they were adopted. I didn't realize he didn't like his dad. His dad was always showing us lasers from where he worked and interesting stuff. I thought he, the sort of stuff that you'd be interested in. And I thought his dad was really nice, but Steve didn't get along with him that well. Um, Steve had worked selling surplus parts at a local surplus parts dealer. And he, and he would sometimes discover somebody that had a bunch of parts for six cents that he could sell for $6 each. And he'd make a purchase of a hundred parts and, and make money like that. And I thought, whoa, that just sounds a little wrong. You'd get it for six cents and sell it for $6. Why wouldn't you tell the person you're selling it to what it cost you? And another thing that Steve did back in high school, he talked to me that for the first meeting we ever had, he talked to me about how he and some friends had made a movie, frame by frame, claymation, animation movie. So, you know, you never hear about that. When you hear about Pixar, yeah, he did, um, it started way back early in his life. Um, he'd also read a book and he said that there were a few special people, the Einsteins and the Newtons that moved our progress forward in the world moved life forward and there were only very few of those and in this book all the rest of the people kind of didn't matter they didn't make any difference to how history went and steve always talked like he wanted to be one of those special people that were the ones you know moving the world in a forward direction you know if you don't want to solve problems or move the world forward you're not gonna you have to want to having the want and the desire the inspiration to do something is more important i taught elementary school for eight years after apple i did it quietly with no press but it was more important to inspire the students to want to learn than it was to actually teach them material. Um, the company that I was working for, uh, making that great computer that they sold to the state of California, went bankrupt. There was a big recession, they went bankrupt. They had a great computer, all done, operating systems, languages, incredible hardware. And it was difficult to understand, how can you make a product successfully, a good product, and still go bankrupt? That always bothered me. Um, Headed, headed off to a great year at Berkeley. Oh my God, um, 
a uh, little, bit, little bit on the prank side. This was back in the Vietnam days, and we had demonstrations that came down, you know, Shattuck and, and Bancroft and broke every single window and every single store, and there were, the cops were shooting rubber bullets, and it was always fun to find one. And I, I kept trying, me, I kept trying, you know, I like to do the things you can never get a chance to do again in your life. So I always wanted to go out there when they were about to throw a tear gas canister. I always wanted to run over and get somebody to take my picture by the tear gas canister going off. Never quite succeeded. Now, did I ever have an engineering schedule for Berkeley? I, I was now a junior and I could sign up for the courses I wanted. So I took a couple of grad courses in hardware design, a couple in software design. They were all in the same room in Quarry Hall all four of my courses. And on Monday and Wednesday, I'd go to this classroom, the same classroom, sit in the same chair for two classes in a row. And Tuesday and Thursdays, I'd go to that same chair and sit for two classes in a row. And none of my classes started before noon. Always in the same chair. You just couldn't do, do write that into a book. Um, Steve, Steve Jobs was, was coming up a lot to visit me in the dorms and I'd drive down to PM and we had discovered these little devices that if you put tones into an American telephone, you could make free calls all over the world. And it was a little startling. And it wasn't like, you know, I was careful that I wouldn't make any of my own phone calls that way, but I sure did explore the system. How far can you get? How do you get to these international operators and talk them into connecting you through satellite to another international operator and around the world and you talk in one phone and hear yourself a second later? It was just so interesting. So that was the first time Steve took one of my designs and he said, let's sell it. And so, so we actually sold some of those here. Um, after that year at Berkeley, I had totaled my car. It's a great page in my book, The, the Night I Met Captain Crunch. Um, I'm not gonna go through it. I'm not gonna go through it. It's the best, best few pages in the book um, for a great story. But I, I, I didn't have the money. I totaled my car and didn't have the money for my fourth year of college. So I went to work for a year, supposedly one year. Didn't drop out of college. And the hottest product in the world I managed to buy one with all the money I did have. It was the HP 35 scientific calculator. The first handheld scientific calculator of all time. The one that was gonna put slide rules out of existence in a couple of years. This was an every single engineer, every scientist had to get this calculator because instead of slide rules, you could type in 10 digit numbers and see digital answers and get them instantly and immediately and accurately. And this, for engineers, this product changed the world. Somehow, HP heard that I was some hot computer designer and they brought me in for interviews and hired me as an engineer designing the calculators. So what an incredible chance in life to be on, you know, the hot moving products of the world to get to work there. It's like if you loved Apple products so much and you got a job at Apple. So my job was designing the digital logic inside of chips and then laying out, doing some chip layouts actually. And I would go and use the computer. We had one Hewlett Packard mini computer and teletypes and big apparatus that we all shared. So 40 of us engineers would sign up for time slots, get on the computer, run our programs, and I would write simulations that simulated my designs, ones and zeros, bit by bit, and see how they came out and make sure they work. So um, that's what I would do on that computer. And I kind of, you know, would have loved to have my own computer, but that comes a hair later. Our calculators at Hewlett Packard used what was called reverse Polish notation. Anybody know what reverse Polish notation is? You know, anybody who's been through computer software or algorithm expression um, solutions knows that at the end, you put in, if you want to add two numbers, you put the two numbers in first, and then you say add them. And that's how our calculators work. So we thought our calculators are more sophisticated, more computer science, more powerful and macho than normal calculators where you say two plus three. And um, we had a big equation on a card that you, we could solve with our calculators, but boy, was it hard. I tried over and over, it had so many subterms, you know, this minus that squared, and it was kind of like the big statistics problems. I could solve it on my calculator. Texas Instruments introduced a new calculator. They came out with a calculator that used parentheses instead of reverse Polish notation. Parentheses, five plus three, parentheses times six. And that's, the parentheses told you what order to do things in for a long equation. And we laughed at it. We said parentheses make it a toy. The same way people were gonna someday say, graphics makes the Macintosh a toy. And we laughed at it in Hewlett Packard. And they brought the calculator over by my cubicle and about six engineers were standing around and 
one marketing guy and I said, hey, I'll try the big equation. We had this big card. I said, I'll try it because I thought of myself as being pretty smart. And I sat down there and looked at the equation and saw, here's the term you do first. So I have to hit about six parentheses or is it seven? And I'm thinking, there's no way in the world I'm ever going to get this straight. No human could do this. And I did something that's very important that a lot of people have trouble doing. I cleared my head out. You pretend you don't know anything. What would you do? There has to be a way. Wait a minute. Why don't I type it in from left to right? I typed in the equation from left to right as fast as I could go, guessing if square root was prefix or postfix, first or left, and got the right answer the first time. And the other engineers were kind of stunned. How do you do that? And I held it, handed it to each of them, and I said, type it in from left to right. I couldn't get one other engineer to type it in from left to right, parentheses and everything. They all wanted to use the skill that they had built up of looking at a complicated expression, figuring out which part to do first and which part to do second, and wanting to do them in that order. You don't want to give up a skill sometimes, so you miss spotting when something comes along that's easier and simpler. You know, why have two languages, one for the calculator, one for handwritten expressions? Steve Jobs around this time wanted to go to Reed College because one of those special people in the world that got a Nobel Prize was at Reed College. And I drove Steve up to Reed College in Portland, Oregon, visited him quite a few times um, in the next months. And the first day he got there, he brought a card to me. He said, look, here's the classes they're telling me I have to take. And I looked at it and it was literature, you know, and calculus and, you know, or some kind of math and, and history. It was the normal stuff that you take. And I said, yeah, that's what you get when you go to college. And he said, oh, no, no, he only thought you'd go to college and you'd take Shakespeare and quantum physics and all these neat things. And, uh, and so he didn't go to classes for the first week. He just sat in this tent with his girlfriend in the dorm. And I thought, this, I could never do that. I could never be that brave. Well, Steve was more like a true hippie of the day, a counterculturist, kind of going through life with a lot of friends and everybody lives on nothing and has almost nothing, no money and just some sandals and lives the very, very, very simple life. And so he, and, and me, I admired all the counterculture thinking of those days, but I didn't become it. I was still gonna be middle of the road, feet on the ground, an engineer, have a home someday, have a family, but I really admired the thinking. My head was very free and open. So um, uh, he, lived, he somehow talked them into letting him stay at Reed College for a couple of years with no money for dorms and no money for tuition, but they liked it. If you're persuasive and people like you, you can get a lot of things. And he, he always got lots of things easy by, by being who he is, and he's very um, impressive and intelligent. Well, I'm back at Hewlett Packard, and my love in life is engineering, and I'm so shy and such a geek that I'm never going to have a girlfriend or a wife. So when I came home from work on calculators, I went to work on other projects that I loved in electronics. I just did it. I worked on hotel movie systems for friends. I did all of this for free. I would just take jobs and fly to LA and design some digital stuff for the first hotel movie systems when nobody had ever seen a movie in a hotel in, the, in their life. I got to work on the early VCRs before anybody ever saw a VCR. The first consumer VCR was not the Sony Betamax. It was an American company called Cartrivision. Built them into some Sears TVs, went bankrupt right away, and we Hewlett Packard engineers could go down and buy them in San Jose for 60 bucks each, a color VCR, when black and white ones cost a thousand bucks for schools. Incredible, incredible opportunity. Uh, I started the first dial a joke in the San Francisco Bay Area. I take credit for that one. You dial this number, and I would tell a Polish joke. Hello, thank you for dialing dial a joke. And then the Polish American Congress complained, and I said, what if I switch into Italian jokes? And they said, that's fine. This was before political correctness. And um, dial a joke, well, that's, I did this in 1972 when it was illegal in the United States to own, use, or purchase your own telephone. It was illegal in the United States to own, use, or purchase your own answering machine. So, um, so it was, I had to lease the one machine that the phone company offered and it cost as much as my apartment rental. You know, imagine you're just out of college and you're paying for an apartment and then you have to pay again that amount just for an answering machine. But I, want, I was so into humor, I wanted to run the first dial a joke and I ran it for a couple of years. And because it was like a chat room, I was anonymous. All these people were calling, they didn't know who I was. And so I could come home from work and take calls live and I actually met my first wife that way. And prankster as I am, I, the first thing I said to her was, I can hang up before you, and I did. 
Steve Jobs, you know, oh, oh, before that, um, I went into a bowling alley with Alice and there was a Pong game. The first time ever I saw a little TV screen playing a game and I, my jaw opened. I couldn't believe it. Television set can play a game? Who ever heard of that? Pinball games were always had, all we had before that. And as I stared at it, I said, I could build one of those because I know digital electronics and I know television signals from high school. I can build my own Pong. I'm gonna build my own. I couldn't afford one, so I had to build it. And I did, and it was, you know, very few chips, and I even put in a couple of proms from work and had programmed them so that when you missed the ball, it spelled a four-letter word like heck. Steve Jobs came back from Oregon, and, he, and he's the sort of person, I told him all about Pong and everything, he went down to Atari and got a job. <laughs> So that quickly, and so he was in there kind of like fixing up the machines they designed. He wasn't quite engineer level. And he came to me one day and he said, Nolan Bushnell, who owns Atari, wants you to design a game. He's sick and tired of his own engineers designing games with 100 chips, 120 chips, 150 chips, 180 chips. He wants small ones and he knows you design things small. And, he, and Steve described to me this one player Pong game called Breakout. And I said, yeah, I, oh my God, it'd be the greatest thing in my life to design a game that people are gonna play in bowling alleys and stuff. Kids are gonna play. How incredible. And Steve said, well, there's a hitch. We have to build it in four days and nights. It wasn't software back then, it was hardware. Little chips with voltages that went high and low and you had to hook wires to make other chips go high and low to get signals into a TV set that showed up as balls and paddles. That was a six man month job. So four days and nights, I didn't think I could do it, but I sat down and started designing. We didn't sleep for four days, either one of us. We both got the sleeping sickness, mononucleosis. We delivered a working breakout game to Atari. While I was there, I was kind of, you know how you are when you're falling asleep and you're hardly awake and your mind's drifting? It's almost like you're, like, uh, I don't know, it's almost like you're hypnotized, sort of hallucinogenic or something. All the, the games and Atari at that time were built with black and white TV sets. Little dots going in black and white. And I went to the factory floor and this one game had a bunch of mylar on the screen. Red, green, blue, orange. And as the ball went across the screen, it was changing colors like a rainbow. And I was just mesmerized by this color effect. The color is so important in the world. And then into my head popped an idea of a way to take a little $1 chip spin it around at the right speed and get all sorts of signals out that would look like color on an NTSC television, art in American television. So I filed that idea away. The next thing, after breakout, Steve Jobs and I went to visit a friend who said he had something big to show us and he's down in a basement typing on the big teletype machine and he says, I'm playing chess with a computer in Boston. And he was on the ARPANET, the early forerunner of today's internet. And he brought up a list of computers, Stanford, Berkeley, UCLA, you know, Illinois, um, um, MIT was on there, about 12 computers and you could log on. It's that getting far away thing that makes you super powerful and a you know, superhuman. And I said, as I, I drew, and I said, I have to have this. 